Uh, we have four speakers tonight. They'll start with, with, with brief interventions and then we'll have uh, Q&As and, and, and exchange on their intervention. We'll start with Valtraud Schelke, who's been with the London School of Economics since 2001 and is currently a professor of political economy at the European University Institute. And she's worked a lot on, among other things, the political economy of European integration, monetary issues in particular, which I'm personally. Uh, and Guillaume Plantin, the scientific director of Sciences Po, by the way. Then after Valtraud, we'll have Anke Hassel, who was already with us for a webinar a couple of weeks ago on a different topic. She's still a professor of public policy at the Hertie School, uh, and she's still an expert in, among other things, labor relations and the comparative political economy of developed industrialized nations. Then we'll have an intervention by Anton Emmerich from EUI as well, who's a professor of critical science and sociology there. Uh, his research interests include social investment in Europe. And the last intervention will be by Bruno Pallier, who's a CNRS research director at the Center for European Studies and Comparative Politics here at Sciences Po. He's also the director of our research center for interdisciplinary evaluation of public policies, the VIEP, and he's, he's worked a lot on welfare reforms in Europe. So this event is um, a Civica event. For those of you who don't know yet what Civica is, it's an alliance of uh, universities, all specialized in European universities, specialized in social sciences, supported by the European Commission. Uh, so that's eight universities, eight members, four are represented today, Sciences Po, EUI, LSC, and the Hertie School. Four others are CEU, SNSPA, Stockholm School of Economics, and Bocconi. Uh, so we're trying to join forces and make the voice of European social sciences heard loud and clear in the world. We think it's an important time. It's always been important, it's particularly important time for, for doing so. So we're in the process of coordinating and building lots of research events. And this webinar is a, is a first interesting sample of what we're going to do together. All right, so let me uh, leave the stage to Valtraud for the first intervention. Welcome, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a short presentation. Let me just say, I'm Valtra Czechi from the European Institute at LSE, so uh, Anton and I are friends, but we're not colleagues at the same institution. So I really want to make, in principle, a very simple point. Um, before I make it, let me briefly look with you at what has been done in the immediate response to the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. And I look here at the uh, data that has been collected by the Bruegel Institute, uh, the immediate fiscal impulse, so really discretionary measures that governments have put up that are immediately hitting your budget in terms of a deficit. Deferral are things like a postponed tax or social security contributions, and then other liquidity guarantee uh, measures that mean you guarantee, for example, loans to businesses that may or may not uh, materialize in the sense of a loss to the government that then would have to be honored and could also lead to a deficit and that, of course. I highlight just briefly a few things. The first of all, if you look at the first a uh, few countries, all apart, uh, with the exception of the United States at the bottom are European countries, how different they are in the measures they taken. So there is no one size fits all. Well, some people would say too little coordination. That's what you see here. Something that struck everybody is how much Germany has, has exposed itself and has really had the biggest program across the, all the three types of measures. Um, you see that Germany is in this high group that I have marked with some uh, little uh, quadrants. It, the, the other countries you see uh, are, that I highlighted are France, um, to some extent Italy, the United Kingdom and the U United States. The United States is actually small, except for the immediate fiscal measures. That was something we already know from the great financial uh, 
crisis in 2008-9. So the short-term measures are extremely high, this time only topped by Germany. The United Kingdom is also relatively high. So in the great financial crisis, this would have been on the high end of fiscal stimulus measures. But what strikes us this time is these measures of deferred uh, revenue measures, basically, and then using your balance sheet as a public entity to uh, guarantee and underwrite basically all risks that businesses have. That is something we haven't seen like that before, and that's one of the first things to note, how this time, I would say, the welfare state has come in to really guarantee business and, and scale up to uh, help businesses in a way that we haven't seen before. On the EU, the aggregate EU response, finally by 9th of April, they came to some decisions. By mid-March, the ECB, the European Central Bank, had already announced this pandemic emergency purchasing program to the tune of 750 billion. It expanded the eligibility of of assets uh, under the corporate uh, sectoral purchasing programs and other QE quantitative easing measure for corporates and lowered the collateral standards against which it lends to banks basically to chunk bond status. So it takes anything. The single supervisory mechanism, so the ECB as a financial supervisor ordered banks that benefit from all this liquidity support to refrain from paying any dividends and from buying back shares so that they keep their capital buffers that can absorb some losses. That is for the first time that central banks can do something like that. Others have done it too. Um, maybe adding strings to the liquidity support in the great financial crisis. We had uh, massive, massive interventions in favor of the banks and they had nothing else to do but in 2010 paying themselves uh, historically high uh, options and bonuses and so on. So this kind of obscene uh, advantage taking is not possible anymore. And it's thanks to the new uh, authorities of central banks as financial supervisors and regulators. By mid-April, the member states had then announced discretionary fiscal measures amounting to 3% of EU GDP. That is not minor, but you have also seen uh, who does it and so on is quite, uh, you know, quite diverse and it adds up in the aggregate to uh, 3%, which is, is higher than the United, uh, not higher than the United States, but two thirds of, of the UK, um, plus public guarantee schemes and liquidity support to 16% of EU GDP, that is higher than uh, what we have seen with the United States in particular, but also uh, the UK. EU state aid rules were eased. Perhaps we come to that in the discussion because that has, in the present situation, quite diverse uh, effects. More than half of these state aid exemptions have been requested and been granted to Germany, and that has created a bit of an issue. What that shows you is, of course, EU state aid rules do not just constrain fiscal authorities, as it's often said. It also constrains the weaker, uh, it also constrains the stronger fiscal authorities and protects, to some extent, the weaker ones, not being outbid by those with a lot of fiscal room for maneuver. And here is my simple point. I think what this reaction shows, and it's a bit of a silver lining, if you will, in all this talk that we think the welfare state has become unremittingly neoliberal and downsized and can't respond. Actually, European welfare states can very quickly become Keynesian if necessary, and the government is willing to do so. Hungary, for example, is not willing to do so. It stabilizes, first and foremost, the macroeconomy. There is basically no other actor that can do this. Um, and this is what they have done, the central bank plus the fiscal authorities together. It is also Keynesian in my understanding that it has this social liberal thrust. So we do see a redistributive uh, uh, impact. So you give you give grants and 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 uh, loan guarantees and and short time work su subsidies. To, uh, to up to a certain level of income so that the lowest incomes are covered to some extent. But it's liberal in the sense that it tries to 
hand out quickly money and not saying uh, we subsidize food banks and everybody can go to a food bank or uh, we give very specific uh, benefits to people. No, you give them a subsidy and or a, a grant, a transfer, and they can basically do with it what uh, what citizens in a, in democracies like to do. Um, that has seen some leakages because they, people may also just save it, and that is something that the Keynesian uh, welfare state has over, always has accepted, even though it it reduces the impact of any stimulus measure. Finally, I would say the measures have shown that one is mindful of the need for international cooperation, although we have in particular in the beginning also seen that it's not always easy and it was uh, excruciating to watch how badly the EU, the EU member states reacted to, the, to Italy's call for support. But it was always a Keynesian concern to say if we are not managing to cooperate, then that will lead to protectionism and so on and so forth. So that's all fine, but as scholars, we never end just with a wonderful, happy ending. It also shows the limitations of this Keynesian response, and this is perhaps something we would like to discuss further in this um, panel. And I take, for example, this emphasis on short-time work, follow schemes, we call it in uh, Britain, chômage partiel, uh, I think it's called in France. So. Instead of a basic income or social assistance for all, which frankly would have been cheaper, uh, we get these status preserving benef benefiting predominantly insiders of the labor market through uh, wage replacement by the state for uh, workers to be able to stay in employment, uh, even though they are kind of out of work. And I think this was because a basic income and social assistance for all was politically unpalatable. Uh, it would have come as a shock, I think, for ordinary, normal, middle class people, how low these benefits have become, how low social assistance, basic income, has for and all that is now. So we didn't want to inflict that on these normal taxpayers and, and workers. The extension to self-employed zeroes hours contracts and gig economy workers has proved difficult. I mean, I observed this in the UK, and Anke and Anton may have more to say about that, and, and Bruno, uh, how that looks in the countries they live in and countries they know. In the UK, it is has not been paid out yet. The self-employed can now have a chance in June to get some of this, this income. And we also have seen that we have essentially national responses, and even if they're coordinated, they do not get around the fact that the debt, the recession hits the national budget and therefore exposes the hardest hit countries, I mean by that Italy and Spain, to financial attacks. And this will be the problem for the future to which national welfare states have no answer. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Anke will be next. And thank you, uh, Bruno, for. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, okay. So thank you, Guillaume, and thank you, Bruno, for inviting me for on another panel. Um, on the impact of the coronavirus for European welfare states. Um, last time I actually talked more about the short-time working scheme, so I uh, skipped that for this time, but I think we, in the discussion we can talk about it more. Um, what I would like to talk about is um, in to what extent and in what way does the COVID-19 virus affect labor markets? And my um, argument would be is that what we have seen in the last over the last decade or so was already a, a process of polarization of labor markets and uh, what we should expect in the aftermath of the um, coronavirus is that we see a deepening of polarization in the labor market and to some extent um, this is different to what we have seen after the financial crisis in the financial crisis a lot of people lost their jobs and we had uh, a big uh, 
effect on people's income, but also the labor market status. But in the end, it was also a leveler that people with high capital incomes actually lost more and social inequality for a while was actually leveled by the financial crisis. I would not expect that as a result of um, the corona crisis, even though governments have stepped in much more and have stepped in with big programs as uh, Waltraud has uh, uh, just mentioned. I think, and the secondly, um, in the beginning, I would like to say that we actually do not know much yet about the state of the labor market. What do we do know is the figures we see in the United States. We do know how uh, unemployment has risen uh, dramatically over the last uh, couple of weeks. We know that in Europe, short-term working schemes have stopped that from happening. But other than that, how unemployment will develop over the next couple of months, especially when furlough schemes are coming to an end. Most furlough schemes in the, the EU are actually a fixed term. They will run out over the summer like in the United Kingdom, which has now uh, prolonged it for another three months, but they will stop and they will come to an end. And then we will see what the state of the labor market is in many of the European countries. So we do not know much, but we should expect a deepening of polarization. And um, before I uh, argue this, I, I would like to say a little bit about the trends before Corona. And before Corona, we already had trends towards polarization, and we had that in two different ways. And the first one is uh, the polarization of the labor market. And that is a trend which goes between <clears throat> that we had jobs going either to the high end of the labor market or to the low end of the labor market. And what happened was that the jobs in the middle were basically lost, and they, they, the middle paid jobs were in decline over a, quite a long period of time now. And, and that has, has less to do with economic policy, but it has a lot to do with new technology. It has to do with trends of, of autom automation, and it has to, uh, to do with a trend towards more non-routine based tasks, vis-a-vis routine based tasks. And these routine based tasks were more in the middle of the labor market. And uh, the, the other two types of jobs were more either at the high end or at the low end. So polarization of the labor market was already in full swing uh, in, the, in the decade before for Corona. But we also had polarization within the welfare systems. And this was more a, a, a trend towards polarization between generations. We had uh, older generations being much better protected by the welfare state, younger generation much more vulnerable. But we also saw these new risks, for instance, among migrants, but also among women. Women have not caught up to, uh, to, over the last two decades. And in particular, single mothers have not caught up. So single parents on the whole were, were also among the groups which were not protected vis-a-vis -vis, um, other people in the labor market. So new risk, polarization within the welfare system and polarization on the, uh, the labor market. And um, I would just like to show you one graph where we can see this. And this is the graph which is often used by labor economists uh, who want to show how the change in occupational status have um, played out over time. And this is a comparison of e European countries between 1993 and 2010. And the red bars are the bars which are in the mid-level paid category. And you see that in all of these countries, there has been a market decline in employment for middle paid jobs. And if you look at the gray bar or the blue, dark blue bars, these are either the very low paid or the very high paid. And you see that in almost all of these countries, you see a rise uh, in high paid occupation. And this, uh, the rise in high paid, uh, paid occupations is stronger than the rise in low paid occupations. But uh, in all of them, you see an increase and you see a decrease in middle paid jobs. And this is the polarization that has been going on before Corona. So what happens if within Corona? And here, as I said, we do not know much. We have some studies which have looked at who is actually affected by the lockdown. And this is a study by the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and that has been done for um, the UK labor market. And it looked at the share of employees in shutdown sectors, and it looks at it in it divided by gender and by age groups. And what you can see is that about 35% uh, of women under the age of 25 are affected by the lockdown. So 35% of all women under the age of uh, 25 are not working at the moment, but are affected by, uh, are on a furlough scheme. And you see that for men, you can also see that the highest group um, 
the, the group that is most uh, strongly affected by the lockdown is also uh, the, the age group of the under 25. So again, the young people are more affected uh, than, older, uh, than older age groups. And this is, um, you know, this is driven by the fact that the young people are most more likely, in particular, the very young people are more, more likely to be uh, employed in the service industries and then in those services which are now hit by the coronavirus, in particular restaurants and other service uh, industries. And you find the same effect if you look at, um, <clears throat> at the, uh, how it is divided by individual earnings. And again, you see that about 35% uh, of those in the lowest decile of income are affected by the shutdown, and it's only 4% of those people in the highest decile are affected by the shutdown. And so again, the, the people with low pay are much more affected by the lockdown compared to people with uh, high incomes. And that is also not uh, a surprise because people with high income are people who can work in home offices like we do at the moment, and they are able to continue their work, whereas those people who have to go out to work um, more often have low incomes and they are affected by the lockdown. So this will deepen polarization because once the labor market comes out of the lockdown and once we, we see how companies will restructure and adapt to a new environment, we will see that a lot of these people who are now affected by the lockdown will ultimately will lose their jobs because some of the companies will not survive and some of the jobs will not be there anymore after the lockdown. So polarization, um, there are indications of polarization. And another um, ad, uh, data source of data I want to show you has to do with home office, and this follows immediately uh, from what I said before. If you look at who can work in, in home office, you can see that those with higher incomes, with incomes above 2,500 euros per month, and this is a German study, it's, the, it's a, a study uh, done by colleagues in Mannheim, they will... Um, you see that home office is very unevenly distributed and those people with lower incomes are not able to, to, uh, to, um, to work in their home offices. So ultimately, you know, my expectation would be we see further polarization and we see the p further polarization and uh, in particular groups. I think the young people will be more um, uh, affected than, uh, uh, than uh, middle-aged people. We might also see among very old people that they will be affected because they will um, now be also on short-term working and they might lose their jobs. We might, be, we might see more discrimination against the older generation, but that is you know, above the age of 55. We will see, and that has been a, a talking point, uh, at least in, in, in German discussions now a lot, that we see polarization uh, which will work against women because in the moment you shut down schools, you have much more care work to do at home and the division of labor within families is that women are much more likely uh, to do care wor work at home and housework and homeschooling. They take on uh, most of the homeschooling, so their participation in work, even if, if, even if they are able to work in home office, is uh, likely to be, uh, to be much lower. And finally, we will also see that vulnerable groups on the labor market about uh, who we haven't talked about yet at all, and these vulnerable groups are migrant workers, they are posted workers, they are seasonal workers, they, these are people working for employment agencies, will also be affected much more because when the, the economy and co companies will restructure after the crisis, a lot of their jobs will, uh, will be gone after that. So this is uh, my expectation. As I said, we, we do not know much about what will be the situation in six months down, down the road, but I think we should expect further polarization from the crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anke. Anton? Yes, I will do share screen. Okay, this one. And Okay, um, let me start by so looking at this graph and then another one. And this is history, so we're not, we don't know what's going to happen next. But what is interesting is that, you know, over the past decades, in Europe especially, there has been a tremendous growth in employment. And today, Sweden 
is not that different from Germany and Denmark is not that different from, from the Netherlands. But what I find most surprising still is when you look at the dotted line, there is, that's the US. Now, if you look, go back in time, around 19, late 1990s, the US had the highest employment level um, together with Sweden. And the US at that time also had some of the highest participation rates of women. Now, if you look at the middle of this figure, and that's the time of the Great uh, Recession, you see already the US was going down, but in the recession, it really went down severely. And this is rather puzzling because the US, as Waltraud just said, had a very aggressive fiscal policy to save car manufacturing and what have you. But this hasn't had a very serious effect on employment rates. And then later in the stage, you see that the US only ri rises very gradually. Now, recently with the tax reform of Trump, the US is getting back uh, uh, um, into shape. Now, if you then look at the European countries, they all are hit by the crisis and were not supported fiscally uh, as they were uh, in, in the US. But somehow, you know, a country like Germany, which obviously did very well in the crisis, um, went from a very low level of participation to very high levels of employment, especially uh, uh, for, for women. Now, if you go back in time, you can see that Spain was on a par with um, uh, uh, Germany in the early 2000s. Now, obviously we all know that in the, in the Eurozone crisis, Spain um, was se severely uh, 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 damaged. But later in the stage, as we have seen before 2019, employment started to grow again uh, in Spain significantly. I mean, Italy, as is it's the purple line has always been a problem case you know employment rose a little bit then you know the crisis put it back uh, to where it was uh, before and surprisingly france is the country in the middle that hasn't seen any rise in in employment uh, uh, over over the years and 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 over the the crisis now here's another thing which I think is, is, is interesting to, to, to look at. What I've done here is I looked at the employment rate as I did in the previous uh, uh, figure of 2019. And what I, what I mapped, that is, that's the balloons, that's the, the size of the welfare state. So public spending on social protection and social services and I divided up the world in cash transfers, sort of the, the, the buffer quality of the welfare state and benefits in kind. Now, what is very interesting to see that countries that do relatively, relatively well in terms of equity are countries that do relatively well in employment. And essentially the argument is that, you know, you can have decent social protection if you have by very high levels of, uh, of, uh, of employment. And when you look at the countries near uh, the middle, they have bad equity results, but not as bad as the US. Um, um, and they have relatively low employment rates. And, and, and this is a, a problematic that plays out very hard in, in the Eurozone. And, we'll, and that's something that we will be confronted with uh, uh, um, in, 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 in the next round, the next round that's gonna be much tougher uh, uh, than, than the initial uh, uh, stage. So on the one hand, there's a good news story. And the good news stories is that those countries, you know, at the sort of right-hand side uh, of the previous figure are the ones that have the more inclusive buffers and they have adjusted their buffers their social assistance and social security to more volatile labor markets. Not, in, not perfectly, I'm not saying that. They also have improved the gender balance uh, in, in, in the welfare state. And this is the, the, to ease the flow of work life uh, and labor market transitions uh, uh, over the life course. And mostly so the Scandinavian countries, they have you know, moved to a commitment 
uh, on human capital stock that is that is lifelong and you know and from uh, 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 this is not something that is easily financed through private funding like like healthcare. So, what is the legacy of the Great Recession here? I think the legacy of the Great Recession, this is not, not recognized enough, is that the active, active welfare state is really the unsung hero. Now, I think Waltheit made a very important point. If you look at, you know, EMU, it used to be the fiscal austerity club, uh, in a way. And it has become, thanks to Mario Draghi, something like a monetary insurance union in the making and there's touch and go between fiscal and monetary but you know nonetheless i think this is recognized at the european level um, much better than ever before and you know we had the ruling of Karlsruhe earlier this week which is uh, uh, very frustrating but 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 you know what i what i point paint out here is i think the the, the bigger trend now the other legacy of the of the great recession is structurally low uh, uh, interest rates and and they generate potentially generate a very high multiplier returns on social investment on human capital stock development over the life course on easing the flow of these life course transitions and by creating better buffering welfare states that are more inclusive so this is sort of you know you can say this is the good news now obviously there are fault lines that are coming our way because you know we're just talking about the initial response to the crisis i mean the really the unemployment shock still has to happen and 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 as anke said you know the furlough schemes will you know peter off and then you know we're back uh, at uh, at the political discussion table um uh, you know what to do and First and foremost, I would think, you know, the, the, the biggest fault line is, you know, is the Eurozone able to, to prop up its insurance union with fiscal policy? And, and luckily, earlier this week, the, 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 the German employers, um, they are now sort of clamoring for more fiscal insurance, which is, um, which is very important. But, but that's where the, the pain is going to come. There's going to come a new Eurozone uh, crisis. Second fault line is political complacency. There's a lot of emergency buffering right now. I mean, it sounds very drastic, and 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 uh, I mean, Switzerland and 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 Germany are, have committed uh, for the next uh, uh, ten years. This doesn't show up in Baltraud's uh, figures because you know the Dutch only do it you know on a month by month base, basis. Um, but buffering cannot be the only show in town. It's, you know, the stocks and the flow that really matters uh, 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 in knowledge economies and aging societies. Um, um, then there are these divergences that are left over from the Great Recession, which, you know, we cannot correct <laughs> right now. Uh, um, there's a discussion to pay the frontline workers uh, 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 better, but there will also be a discussion you know, with huge increases in debt and deficits that you know, these things need to be cut. Um, we're gonna have uh, taxation uh, battles and obviously uh, there's gonna be major industrial uh, 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 restructuring. And in these uncertain times, little things can turn out to be big accidents. And I'm not saying the Karlsruhe ruling is, is gonna be that way, but you know, uh, yeah, I'm not saying, you know, this is another Weimar uh, failure, but, 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 but policymakers really have to be careful. I was, I was talking to um, Nicola Schmidt uh, uh, last week, uh, the, the commissioner for employment, and he kind of asked me to say, you know, what, what should DG Employment do now? DG Employment knows much better what it should do, so they should not listen uh, to me. But nonetheless, you know, I wrote something down. And obviously, you know, the biggest temptation today for DG Employment is to, 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 to jump on the bandwagon of fiscal trench fare, to join, you know, the commission, uh, against you know the, the 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 Netherlands and Germany, 
Um, but I would say frappe toujours the positive macroeconomic externalities of social investment because the evidence is quite uh, uh, strong. And then really defend social cohesion and the regional funds in the, I would think, the expanded EU uh, budget, also on a social investment template, because, I mean, these problems that we're going to be facing next have to be uh, um, uh, tackled in a very differentiated uh, uh, manner. And at the same time, I think this is not so difficult to do, actively monitor all the emergency measures uh, on buffers, the changing of the flow. And we, we, we're, we're experiencing major flow restructuring um, as, uh, as we speak and how stock is gonna be affected uh, by the crisis. Uh, um, and this can be done as a kind of a weather report um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a monthly basis, I would say. And I think there's something that, the, that DG Employment has right now, it's a European pillar of social rights. I mean, that could be held up as kind of a normative template on the policy changes that are now being sort of uh, uh, enacted and to see whether the EU can kind of live up to its commitment to become something like a holding environment for active welfare states uh, uh, to, to flourish um, on the basis of the European pillar of social right. And I think what is, what is crucially important, and I'm not sure that DG Employment is, is the candidate to do this, but I think it's, it's, it's really high time for all of us to articulate a post-COVID-19 EOI welfare uh, settlement, because this is going to be big. We're just at the beginning of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bruno, if you want to. Yeah, Anton, if you want to unshare your screen so that uh, I can unshare, share. share. Yeah. yeah, OK, sure. Sorry. Thank you very much. Okay, so as uh, all my colleagues, I will uh, speak about the past to uh, foresee the future. Uh, but uh, uh, frankly, to to say as strongly as possible that uh, the, the future cannot be a replication of the past because it has been way too costly uh, for those who suffered the most from the uh, aftermath of the crisis, uh, either the people or the countries. So let me start with uh, showing you um, uh, a map uh, which is really uh, showing what I call the dualization of Europe, uh, the north and the, or the north or the center of Europe, if you look at poverty, but you could look at many, many things, including employment rate, as uh, Anton has shown, and the periphery of Europe, where you have the southern European countries, but also uh, some uh, central and eastern European countries and Ireland. And here you see this division between those who have a high level of poverty or people at risk of poverty and those who have less uh, high level or even uh, much lower uh, level uh, of things. And, and, and with colleagues, I have, uh, I have uh, worked in, in showing what happened after um, the, the colleague being uh, Jan Rovny and uh, Alison Rovny, what happened uh, to the countries uh, those belonging to the center who are in a pale pink here and those who belong to what we call the periphery of Europe, which are in a, a dark red here. What happened to them in terms of uh, development? In terms of uh, GDP growth, what you see here from the 90s to the post crisis, you see a big uh, increasing gap in terms of GDP growth between the center and the periphery. The same thing for the employment rate. And this we could see with uh, Anton's uh, graphs, where it has increased after uh, the crisis during the 2000s and 2010s, whereas it has uh, decreased uh, for the uh, periphery. Same thing for unemployment. Unemployment high uh, sky skyrocketed in, uh, in the periphery of Europe, whereas it has increased a little bit in the aftermath uh, of the crisis. Um, and this is true also for the youth unemployment and for the uh, elderly unemployment. This, in this graph, what you can see is that it is a change, a big change, this discrepancy between the North and the South, if you compare to what happened during the 90s. During the 90s, you had the periphery lagging behind the central, uh, the center of the North of Europe, but the, they were catching up in terms of growth, in terms of employment, in terms of uh, unemployment. What has happened on the contrary after 
uh, the uh, financial crisis during the 2010s is that you have had an increasing gap between the center and the periphery in Europe. And this is partly due, this is not the only explanation, there are structural explanations like the growth models, that, like the uh, uh, wage bargaining structure, like many other things, but this is partly due, most obviously due to the adjustment plans which have been implemented all over Europe after uh, the crisis, both in the north and the south, but with different effect and different amplitude. So as you know, the adjustment plans uh, started in 2010, 2011. It was everywhere, including in Germany, including in Sweden, including in the Netherlands, and uh, of course also in uh, Southern Europe. However, they didn't have the same effects on the countries. Uh, for those who are uh, betting on uh, keeping their price and wage low uh, in order to favor export, like many Northern uh, uh, European economies, uh, this kind of a uh, retrenchment and austerity was in a way uh, serving their economic purpose. Whereas if you have a strong role for the domestic demand in your growth model, as it is the case in Southern Europe, including France, then if you retrench and you if you implement austerity, you uh, deepen and worsen the economic situation. Moreover, the size of the austerity plans have been much stronger and lasted longer in the periphery of Europe and especially in Southern Europe. What were these adjustment plans made of? They were made of increasing taxes, a lot actually in many countries, but also wage moderation, wage cuts in many countries, especially in Southern Europe, cuts in public jobs, especially in healthcare in Southern Europe. And I emphasize that this is very important to remember that there has been huge cuts in healthcare expenditure and in public jobs in healthcare systems due to the adjustment plans after uh, the financial crisis. And there has been structural welfare state reforms, labor market flexibilization, uh, postponement of pension age, activation and unemployment insurances, reorganization of healthcare systems. This, this is the menu of the adjustment plans. As you know, for many European countries, this menu has been imposed by the Troika, has been imposed by the European institutions. So if you look here, what happened in some uh, social expenditure, taking the same kind of reference of what has happened in the 2000s and 10s after the crisis as compared to the 2000s, as compared to the 1990s, what you see is that there has been a relative catch up in the educational expenditure, mm. but not in uh, childcare, which is um, uh, very important for social investment, not for active labor market policy, and not for health expenditure. So this is not what happened in this, uh, except for uh, education. So this is uh, a portrait of what happened after in the aftermath. What happens when indebted uh, states had to uh, conform to the EU requirement, either uh, the Maastricht criteria, the uh, growth and stability pacts, and even more with the Lisbon Treaty, and especially for the under the memorandum of understanding. And with colleagues, we have already measured the political consequences of that by uh, the late 2010s, uh, you know, around 2017. Sorry, what you see here is that. Uh, up to 2016, something like that, you have an increase of the radical right in the center of Europe and an, an increase, but not so much, and at, at lower level in the periphery. Whereas what you see is an increase in the radical left uh, in uh, the periphery, whereas you don't really have that in the center. This, I must say, doesn't really take into account uh, the increase in the Lega uh, in Italy that would probably have to be coded and as radical right uh, for Italy. But this is the kind of political consequences. And what you see here is that there are many, many uh, parties who are against Europe, who speak in the name of the people, of those who suffered from the EU integration and its reaction to the crisis, but they are not on the same camps in the north and in the south of Europe. And there are many reasons to be against Europe, but not from the same point of view 
if you're in the center and the periphery. And this is shown in this uh, graph where you see here that you have the uh, EU support, whether you're anti or pro EU as measured uh, with some indicators calculated by Jan Rovding here again, but also Catherine de Vries and, and others. And what you see, of course, is that the radical left and right are very much anti-Europe as compared to uh, government uh, parties, both in the center and the periphery. Why do I show that? I show all these things to say that if the discussion at the European level continues uh, to be uh, whether or not we are able to mutualize the debt, and if the center countries, the Northern European countries continue to say, no way, we will not share, because we have in place useful instruments to cope with the crisis because we've done that once. And my understanding of the German debate, for instance, is that we don't need to go beyond what we have because it already worked pretty well. Uh, we have the, uh, um, you know, all these um, bank union adjustment plans and the semester, etc. So uh, we are fine. Uh, the problem is that the perception of the impact of these plans in Southern Europe has been that because of these treaties and decisions, we have had to cut in the welfare state, especially in healthcare. And this can of course be presented as an explanation for the much higher numbers of deaths that occurred because of the COVID crisis in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal, and in Greece, and especially for Italy, in Spain. And I'm not saying that this is true, but I'm saying that, of course, political parties will be perfectly able to connect the welfare state retrenchment that has occurred, supposedly because of Europe, and the difficulties to face the COVID crisis in Southern Europe. So if people, when there will be the aftermath, uh, and a huge step, especially in Southern Europe. If people and if European debates come back on the usual divide between the serious North and the spending South, what we will see, to my view for sure, is a kind of inversion of my last slides, an increasing in the radical parties, anti-EU parties saying, not a second time. And I think that this threat of uh, radical anti-EU parties overcoming uh, their uh, infringement and uh, minority situation to rely on uh, an anti-European uh, discourse based on we suffered most because we were less prepared, because it was uh, imposed by Europe, we are going into big trouble as far as the EU and especially the Euro uh, is concerned. I'm again not saying all this reasoning is right and uh, true. I'm just saying that there is a huge risk of this kind of rhetoric uh, to combat uh, a second wave of retrenchment that would come back as a normal answer, the usual answer to endowment in at the EU level. So what could be done? Of course, we know already that Germany will be the, uh, the victorious country out of this crisis. We see the number of deaths being much lower, uh, the lockdown being much stricter, therefore the economic uh, down being less marked than in France or uh, Italy. So after the crisis, the level of endowment, uh, the level of economic uh, downturn will be higher in the periphery than in the center. This is uh, already foreseeable. So if we ask mutualization, these kind of things, as Anke explained to me several times, the conservative parties in Germany will never accept business, will never accept these kind of things. But what could be promoted, and here I join Anton, of course, is to say, by the way, we may have not the same economic model, the same level of indebtedness, but we have the same kind of social problems. We have labor market polarization. We have uh, women suffering more. We have younger suffering more. We have vulnerable groups suffering more. And these are the same problems, both in Germany and in Italy. Therefore, we could find similar solutions. And, and under the line of social investment, 
uh, the, uh, uh, the social pillar. And the second thing we share, of course, is environmental issues. So instead of uh, being in confrontation on things that are not solvable together, uh, you know, the economic model and the level of debt, perhaps we should work even more than before on trying to tackle all together the same social problems we have, which is the labor market polarization and the most vulnerable being women, youngsters, uh, migrants, uh, uh, and low skilled people. This might be a way out because all the European countries have to be confronted and have to confront this kind of problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, so the, there are many people attending the <laughs> webinar, but people have been a bit shy so far. There aren't too many questions. There are some specific questions on your presentations. I want, you can reply to them directly uh, in writing, but I'd like to, uh, have a general discussion and your reactions on, on some of the questions that have been asked, or at least my, my, my synthetic view of them. Um, first question that, that summarizes several of them, both Valtraud and Anton have said a bit differently, have expressed a bit differently the general idea that this time it seems like Europe has made a move towards being more Keynesian or less austere, or moving toward, to, toward you know, having more fiscal interventions. And, and question I, I was, one, one thing I'm wondering why, and several people are wondering why, is why is that? Is that lessons from 2008? We've learned what the cost is of not having done enough in 2008. Perhaps the electoral uh, behavior that uh, Bruno has shown um, is a way of having learn that. Uh, another possibility raised by one of the participants is that just that the emergency is felt as much worse than it was in 2008. It's like a war and we have some patterns of a war economy in a sense, mm -hmm. uh, war effort. So emergency perception. And a third possibility that's more a uh, political economy one is that to some extent in 2008, the crisis was it was easier to present the crisis as endogenously resulting from past reckless behave, behavior by some agents, the financial sector, but also some uh, states having borrowed too much, some people having borrowed too much to purchase their homes, etc. And there was this idea that intervening too much was, was raised more hazard issues. Whereas the current crisis, um, nobody in Europe, at least, some people blame China a lot, but nobody in Europe can be directly blamed from, for the rise of, of the pandemic. And so there's less, this, I mean, the idea that people who, who have been reckless should not, uh, that people who have been careful, sorry, should not pay for those who have been reckless is, uh, it's a more difficult case to make. So I'd like to have your full reaction to these three possibilities, bigger, perception of a bigger emergency. We've learned from 2008, that we have to do something, otherwise there's gonna be even more radical voters. Or it's nobody's fault this time, it's an act of God, so we don't induce uh, more hazard by intervening. Among these three possible explanations, how would you rank them? Uh, or if you can come up with a fourth one, I'm happy to. Maybe I would talk out. Um. I think it's it's not a revival of ideas, it's a revival of practice. And it certainly has helped the first reaction in 2008-9 was also pretty Keynesian. I mean, we were all surprised. It then quickly shifted, and as Bruno said earlier, it will be the, and, and uh, Anton, as we go out, we will see how strong uh, uh, that still is. Um, Part of the resilience of the Keynesian welfare state, I mean, I think the possibility of a Keynesian response, i.e. strongly demand stabilizing, underwriting all the risks of the private sector and doing something that no private uh, actor has incentives or capabilities to do, has basically to do also with democracy. I mean, we do expect from our states that they, that they use 
the, 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 the measures at their disposal effectively when something like that hits us, whether that's endogenous because of financial integration that we didn't, worldwide financial integration that we couldn't quite foresee what's going to happen, to now, as you rightly say, Guillaume, a, a pandemic that nobody can be blamed for. It just is bad luck that has hit us. Um, that in, the, in each case, we do expect that a state apparatus that after all has a tax take of about 30 to 40 percent of GDP is also then thrown at these problems. Um, I don't, the, the part of the resilience of this Keynesian uh, capability is that it isn't ideologically so strongly correlated with being left or right. Uh, there can be a conservative Keynesian welfare state and that works with tax measures. And there can be a very uh, progressive one that would nationalize part of the industries and things like that. Uh, in each case, it is this idea, the state does something different from the private sector. And I don't see such a huge difference between 2008-9 and now. We are in early days of the crisis management. Whether there's a difference along the lines you just indicated, and there are good ideas, um, time will tell as we go out. Thank you. Anton, you want to react on that? Yes, I mean, basically on, on the same line. I mean, you, we've seen a very strong comeback on, um, of the interventionist state in, in, in cooperation with health experts whose kind of status have, uh, have risen as, as well. I think there is a learning effect for sure. I mean, austerity didn't really work. Uh, so there is, and, and also politically, there's much less appetite for austerity. I mean, how are we gonna solve the long-term problem that's still to be seen? Um, I think, what becomes very clear right now is that you know this crisis is 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 a crisis of inequality and that crisis of inequality has already been there and we knew it but now sort of like our our blinders have have sort of come off and and there is a need to to address inequality there's need to to treat more fairness to the frontline workers everybody kind of accepts that you know when deficits go up uh, and that goes up you know taxes will have to follow suit and 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 taxes uh, will i mean i think the political uh, context will be such that that taxes will become more uh, progressive and, and 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 less tolerant of uh, of 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 tax loopholes and so so these are all kind of like good signs um, in a way and there is also a sense, and that has to do with with life and death. Uh, you know that that, that, that you, then there needs to be a long term politics rather than a short term crisis management politics. Now, here is the twist. I think you know can that sort of understanding that you know we need a politics of the long term, can that be sustained once we move from the lockdown? to the crisis of unemployment that's going to come in the second half of the year and major industrial restructuring, or do we go back to the short-term politics uh, that we've seen for the past 20 years, uh, focus on efficiency rather than the resilience of our uh, societies? And, and as Bruno uh, pointed out that, you know, the, the, the political complexion today is not a very favored one. I mean, together with a colleague, Philip Genschel at EOI, we did a YouGov survey um, in, and, and for all, of, all over Europe. But, you know, the Italian results are, are really interesting. I mean, the PD is the only party in favor of Europe. But this also is scaring, um, you know, the, the, the policymakers in my country who are really tough on, 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 on fiscal consolidation. I mean, when you look at and, 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 and in this survey, Finland and the Netherlands are the most egotistic European countries. But at the same time, they're the least willing to leave the European Union. In other words, if Macron and Merkel meet and they agree, and you know, you can write a referendum for Finland and the Netherlands, they won't leave, not to worry. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anke, Bruno, you wanted to intervene on this 
first question, why does it seem that we have more proactive budget reaction? Um, yes, I would like to intervene. And I think, um, so we are in early stages and we are still in crisis management, but I think one reason why the response has been so strong also has to do with the measures that have been taken and the lockdown is a deep intervention in citizens' rights and citizens' freedoms. And I think it was uh, not acceptable and it would not have been acceptable that if you as a government um, ban people from going out and ban people from socializing with others, and at the same time, you withdraw their uh, economic basis for them. So mm -hmm. I think the, 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 the reason why so many countries have invented furlough schemes, even though they don't have a traditional furlough schemes, was because that was the only instrument which allowed a government to actually implement a lockdown and tell people you have to stay at home, but mm -hmm. at the same time, don't get a reaction by people say, we need to go out because we need to earn a living. And if I lose my job, I have to do something else in order to, to, to earn a living. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the consequences of a very bad reaction to that we see in the US where even the US tried to do it. I mean, the US had the um, paycheck protection program, which in a way is a very similar program compared to the furlough schemes in, in, in the EU, but it, it did not work because most of the money that was made available actually never or did not get to the people uh, who mm. were meant to receive it because it was processed via banks. And uh, But secondly, because the, at the same time, the, the US um, added uh, the, the flat rate benefit of $600 a week uh, to the unemployment benefit, which made it more attractive for many people to become unemployment rather than stay with their companies and uh, hope for a paycheck through the PPP. So the US did it in a very bad way and you know has sort of perverse effects because of it. But in the EU, you, see, you saw a lot of countries that invented, like the UK, invented a, uh, a furlough scheme where you have uh, paid um, subsidies for, for jobs. Uh, as a first reaction, I think the reason is precisely because you cannot tell people to stay at home and not give them the means to, to for an income. So I think that explains a lot um, why the stimulus now has to, uh, is so strong in the short term. The problem is really what happens in the medium term, and that is what Anton has alluded to, and also what Waltraud has alluded to. You know, how can we, uh, what should we anticipate what is happening in six months' time? And the big problem is that we do not know whether we will actually come out of the lockdown. You know, what we now see in many countries is that they loosen uh, some regulations because they think that, that they have overcome the pandemic in some way. But we do not know whether there will be a second wave or a third wave. A lot of uh, people expect a second or third wave and a lot of people expect that in the autumn there might be another lockdown. So what happens, you know, if we do get a, a, another lockdown, maybe they are more regional because what happens now in, in terms of crisis response is that governments try to decentralize their responses and say maybe we can locate the outbreak of the virus in certain regions and they have to have a regional lockdown and not a national one. But even there, you, you, you really do not know what the implication of that is. You do not know how big these regions will be. You do not know for how long you have to do this. So there's so much uncertainty in it that I expect uh, that governments will be forced to put a lot of money into these schemes, even in the furlough schemes, and extend and extend them, at least on a regional basis, because it, the, the, the bargain is that you can only tell people to stay at home if you provide them with a means of living that will even hold in, in six months time or even a year. So that is the, the big open question there. And if we then eventually come out of this situation, then what happens is that a lot of company will not be there anymore because you know a lot of companies in the service economy will not be able to survive beyond the next six months. So even with a furlough scheme, even you, if you say I subsidize your workers for a long time, they will not be able to pay their rents, they will not be able to uphold their business models which they have. And there I think we come to the European question and the European question is really that those countries that are based on demand-led growth models, you know, and that are based really on the service economy where you have a lot of restaurants and a lot of tourism and a lot of uh, 
you generate growth by um, by the service economy, that these countries will be hit harder than the countries in the north and in northern European countries, which are much more export-led growth models. And there you do have a replication of the division of the Eurozone crisis, that the northern countries will come out of this crisis in a better shape than the southern European countries. And in that way, sort of history will repeat itself, at least the, 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 the problem will repeat itself. And then the big question is, you know, are, have governments learned enough from the last crisis not to repeat the same mistakes in, you know, in, in this new crisis? And that is, I, I would say that is an open question. Thank you. We know you have some. Yes, just uh, I'd like to uh, uh, underline what uh, Valtraud said at the beginning so that we don't forget, uh, because she said the, 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 the answer has been huge. But uh, it has been a specific answer, which is the uh, furlough uh, solution, you know, the, the uh, Kursarbeit. So the first point to be made is that it was a typical German reaction last time. Now it has become a, a, a global uh, reaction. Even the American tried to do that. So the most opposite type of capitalism tried to replicate the uh, CME type of, uh, of answer. Uh, whereas other things could have been done, as uh, Valtraud said, you could have uh, just given uh, more money to people or uh, in, implement a basic income. So that's the first point. And, and uh, I don't know whether it's uh, uh, causal here, but clearly this kind of solution just uh, crystallize and freeze uh, social stratification. And this is why it's so visible for us now, because it, the lockdown also means the society is a bit stuck. And we see much more than we saw before the social, the new social stratification that uh, Anke has been speaking about, and 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 also her graph, Anke's graph about who can telework, who's on the front line, and who's losing jobs and then losing income is quite typical of a polarized society in the knowledge economy. So that that's the first thing, and and the solutions we have adopted has nothing redistributive in itself; it's just freeze. The situation and replicates uh, uh, everything. So it's very likely that uh, when we unfreeze the situation, we discover uh, inequalities already there uh, crumbling and increasing. And, uh, and I'd like to address uh, uh, Ortrud Lesman uh, question uh, and, and, and bypassing. There is no contradiction between Anke and myself because Anke says there will be more polarization and I say that's the very reason for being together in Europe and trying to fight Dispolarization altogether instead of saying the North is, is different from the South, because as far as inequalities and polarization is concerned, Germany has the same kind of social problem as uh, Southern uh, European uh, countries have. That's why uh, this is where we have uh, commonalities. But once again, it may even be uh, that the, the stronger we react now, the less capacity we will have to react afterwards because we spend a lot now and have a lot of debt later. And unless we find a European solution for debt, and here Guillaume should come in the discussion with his expertise perhaps, uh, unless we are able to do that, then we might uh, find more divides between people and between European countries. Thank you very much. So I'd like to bounce back on, on the um, Ortrud Lesman point that perceived some, some uh, divergence between Anke and Bruno. Uh, what I perceived is not between what you said, but based on what you said, maybe some distinct, important distinction between economic and political polarization. Uh, Anke said that economic polarization will probably be stronger uh, in this crisis than the previous one because the 2008 one because in 2008 rich people lost a lot of money and now well they do too but uh many poor people uh, are put in very difficult situation on the other hand again because the 2008 crisis was perceived by many people as partly resulting and certainly being amplified by let's say the elites very broadly or the dominant ideology this might have spurred a lot of political polarization epitomized by the kind of electoral outcome bruno has shown us and regarding the covid crisis it's way too early to tell we're just at the beginning but it seems that again it's more like a war situation where where, where there's not that much backlash against governments thus far except interestingly uh, in France, it seems to start uh, more quickly than 
in any other countries. So I have this view or theory, or I don't know, impression that uh, economic polarization and political polarization uh, have diverging paths uh, when we compare 2008 and COVID-19. When one is particularly pressing, the other seems a little less important. I don't know if, if, if you want to react on that. I, I spoke about this uh, political polarization, and as I said, uh, uh, we find it everywhere uh, after the, uh, the financial crisis, but not in the same direction. Uh, and uh, we find uh, uh, everywhere in Europe good reasons to be against with the, uh, Europe, but in the north, because we don't want to pay for the lazy south, and in the south, because uh, uh, we hate this selfish uh, northern to be caricatural about the, uh, the polarization. Of course, currently we are all confronted with the same kind of virus, same kind of reaction. So perhaps this kind of uh, opposition and polarization is a little bit blurred. And I may be biased by the French situation where indeed uh, distrust against government is particularly higher than in any other European countries. However, my bet is that if we are back to normal, which is uh, the divide between the north and the south and the social polarization, then there, there, will, there will be no reason that we don't find the same kind of political consequences of this social polarization and the divide between the north and the south. The problem is that uh, the second time uh, actors know about it, uh, and I guess that the, uh, the anti-EU populist parties, uh, they are ready to claim uh, now it's a second uh, time and we cannot let it happen a second time. We know the price, uh, the deadly price of, uh, of this kind of uh, uh, solution in, in, in imposed to us. What I don't know is whether the uh, responsible governments, uh, the ones in place, you know, the one in the center uh, of the political uh, space, have learned enough to be able to overcome their usual division. And I'm a bit worried by the fact that the German debates doesn't really overcome this idea that we will not pay for the South, we cannot mutualize the debt, which is clearly uh, a node in the potential solutions that we have. And here we come back to the Karlsruhe ruling. Uh, and I've seen that in the questions that some people would like us to elaborate a little bit on the uh, potential impact of the Karlsruhe. And I don't know whether Anton, you want to come back on that, but this is a, a little bit frightening indeed, um, putting a lot of uh, national German pressure on the government for not going uh, beyond the uh, current treaties. Can I say something on it? Um, it, Bruno, I think one can overdo it a little bit with the polarization. It is clearly there, but on the one hand, you have to see that, for example, Spain and Portugal have always made attempts not to be too closely grouped with Greece. Um, there is also a differentiation between the Eastern, Central and Eastern European countries and the South. Uh, it's not only just Northern and Central. And some coalitions that I look at with a project that uh, Maurizio Ferreira, who is actually in the in the audience and would like also to comment, and Franz Peter Kriese with a lot of postdocs too, uh, the country coalitions are not as fixed as one would think. So that's the first thing. But it's upon all of us to destroy this myth that there is a south and that there is a north. I'm afraid I think a little bit the growth models thinking doesn't help very much on this because in a way it says the south just has a slightly defective growth model and the north has a terribly successful growth model. Unfortunately, it's at the cost of the south, but that's all about it. Otherwise, it's just a powerful machine. And on both, I'm not so sure. To me, the financial crisis was self-fulfilling with the exception of Greece. The financial markets picked us up. And I, for that, I think we need a common debt instrument. Corona bonds would be a good idea just to signal to markets that they cannot divide us. But to think that the rescue of the South, of Southern European countries that have been unfortunately uh, hit by this pandemic because they were first, the mistakes were made, perhaps uh, uh, that you have more intergenerations in, in one family, but spread it more. Nobody knows so far why they have been so much more affected. 
but there is nothing structurally south about this. And it's upon all of us to destroy this myth that the south is now dead and the, the north is, is dead. And that is including our own research. A last element, I mean, you said that uh, what the EU did to European dualization, what is the counterfactual here? If you would say, would European dualization have been better if the EU had not been there? And I tell you, these financial crises didn't happen only in Europe. They happened everywhere because of capital markets that are just in a race for yield that can't be stopped. Apparently, the dualization would have been worse. The EU did react as a reinsurance system, but with a heavy price. The co-payment that were asked for any support was massive. I'm not denying this conditionality of these Troika programs was just extraordinary. However, if I look into debates today about solidarity, sovereignty, and so on, I mean, the Italian North wants now more sovereignty so that they don't have to help the Italian South. So we need to also keep these things a little bit in perspective and always say, compared to what? That's all I want to say. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to bounce back on the course through judgment. Would you like to uh, give us your insights on, on what you think it's going to take us? Anton, for example, was the... <laughs> yeah, I can one try. I mean, question. yeah. I mean, this is a, I mean, this is an unfortunate event, but, but, it, but it, 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 it was kind of bound to happen. I mean, it's sort of in the air. Now, I would think that the European Commission or the European Central Bank can easily, you know, write a, a good report on proportionality that puts this, you know, this, this genie back into the bottle, but then it opens up all kinds of other uh, uh, discussions. So, so, um, and I think that, and it, this, this also goes back to the, to the, the imbalance uh, in, in the Keynesian response, if you want, uh, of, of the European Union. And, and you know, we have a, a fiscal joint decision trap among the member states. And, um, and they, they think, well, you know, the, the hot coil is, uh, is, is taken from the fire by the ECB. And I hope this kind of message uh, um, is dawning on fiscal policy makers to say, you know, you need a balanced fiscal and monetary response. And, and so then we may be back to, to, to the discussion on, on, on Corona bonds. I think what we, what we tend to forget here politically as well, and I think I, I agree with Waltraud on this, is that historically, you know, what we have as a European Union is a European Union of national welfare states. There is n there's no way that, that we're going to have a, you know, a, 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 a social security program for the EU. You can have a reinsurance program for national welfare states. But this, this presupposes that national welfare states do what they can on the basis of their sense of political solidarity. And as I showed in my picture, I mean, this is kind of a revealed preference. I mean, Apparently, inequality is not a big issue as a revealed preference for, for, for Italy, the way it is for Sweden, the Netherlands, and even Germany. Um, and so, and this also has to do with being able to tax people who can pay uh, 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 taxes. And so, coming from the North, I kind of understand that, you know, we pay taxes into our health system and into our social security system, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, this, the Italians don't do it, but, but, you know, there's an issue there. And so that's why I think to, to, to make this, the European Union as a union of active social investment oriented welfare states to prosper, to kind of have an embeddedness of that perspective is very important. Um, uh, and then, and then, and then you can think about, you know, what you do 
at the national level, the way you organize your pension system, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous for the EU to kind of intervene or want to intervene on that. It's ridiculous to ask uh, 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 European electorates, you know, how, how they, they think about pensions because these are nationally defined. And they're, and they're very jealously protected by, by, by political actors and understandably so. You can understand that in this kind of divergent Europe with these massive social imbalances so that's gonna co come back to us, that under fiscal constraints, it will be impossible for, for Italy to finance uh, the schooling of the next generation. And the schooling of the next generation is in the interest also of the Dutch and the Germans. So you could think of a policy where you say, well, let's exempt human capital stock developments from the Stability and Growth Pact for, you know, 1% of GDP. And then you leave it up to the member states to say, Macron wants to spend it on vocational training and education. The Italians want to create jobs for, for women. They may want to open daycare centers uh, for that purpose. And, you know, the evidence is there that, you know, there are huge returns to be made uh, if you do that kind of policies. So it, so it, it, it pays for itself um, in a way. So I think, and also thereby you create the political ownership, you know, of the reformers in these national welfare states. And I think that the, the European pillar of social rights is a perfect benchmark to, 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 to benchmark and to monitor progress also in the COVID crisis on, you know, the principles that are defined there. I mean, they're principles, they're not rights. Um, I mean, I've been reading Piketty and it's sort of like, you know, at the end of the story, it's, you know, we have to Europeanize solidarity, but that's not happen. That's not gonna happen overnight. Surely not. Thank you very much. So webinars are a bit, are a bit like, once, one, one second. And uh, are a bit like uh, rock concerts. Sometimes some people jump from the audience on the stage to uh, play and sing with the band. So we have Maurizio Ferra who jumped on the stage, and, and I'd like to give him the opportunity to intervene as yes. Yes, do you hear me? Yes, yes, yes we can. Okay. I'm sorry, but my video doesn't work. So I can only talk to you. And hello to everybody, of course. Um, yes, I find this discussion extremely interesting, uh, but I would like to make a comment on the South and of course on the Italian case in particular, because I don't agree much with uh, some of the things that um, have been said. Um, now, of course, I agree with the fact that um, the consequences of this crisis will be huge, extremely huge in Italy when the, you know, the temporary measures, relief measures will end. There will be a, a, a shock in terms of unemployment, in terms of poverty, possibly in terms of inequality. And I think that there is no way that the Italian welfare state um, will be able to buffer the shock. Uh, let alone uh, raise, um, raise spending for uh, the things that Anton likes and that I also like. Uh, you know, enhancing human capital uh, of the stock, um, social investment and all that. Now, um, so we will have for a long time, I think, I'm afraid, a deep economic and social crisis. And I want to make two comments. One is about the political implications of this. And the other one is to ask you if you can help me identifying, you know, a, a, at least a feeble prospect of a way out. Now, we are now politically, we are not, we are now going uh, through a phase of, uh, we are all numb politically. Uh, the European Union is no longer perceived because it has lifted the Growth and Stability Pact. So the Italian government can spend uh, whatever they want. Uh, a lot of people didn't know that it couldn't spend before because there were 
uh, EU constraints. Maybe they don't even know that the EU has lifted these constraints. They just now concentrate on the fact that there is money around that the, the government can spend. Um, and to the extent that we now, in the last weeks, talk about Europe is as a, an actor that is possibly going to help us providing resources to, uh, to Italy. And this is why my most recent uh, public opinion data show that um, the sentiment vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis Europe, or let's say that anti-EU sentiments have declined hugely. I mean, all parties, I mean, the voters of all parties, if you take the, the usual integration, support for integration scale, zero to 10, all parties are above six now, above six, including the Lega. Hmm? And that explains why Salvini is no longer, you know, voicing against the EU. He still does so in respect of the ESM, but even there, now he has very little to say against the EMS if they open up this new pandemic um, uh, credit line, right? Um, but this will not last, of course. It will not last. Um, because these parties will, of course, take the opportunity of repoliticize uh, integration and the EU, the moment in which the EU reverts to what? And that's one of my questions. That is it going to reverse, revert to austerity? Uh, is, is, is it going to reestablish the, the rules of the growth and stability pact? I think it will at some point. Um, so that I see a risk there. But my concern is more of an economic nature. Okay, the reason why we have such a huge public debt is that we do not grow and we do not create employment. We haven't been creating enough employment since the 1950s. I have reconstructed the, the, the time series. You know, we have grown a, a few percentage points, but it's a chronic anomaly of the Italian economy that is unable to provide jobs for its own workers. And Yes, possibly a lot of women want to stay home be, or must stay home because of the shortcomings of our uh, welfare state and public services, um, but they don't find work to begin with. And why is that so? Now about this growth model business, Italy is divided in two. The North is an export led uh, growth model. Um, we have the second manufacturing sector in Europe. This sector prior to the Corona crisis had not seen a decline of jobs. In fact, if you take young people, young entrants, the Italian manufacturing sector absorbs more young people every year than Germany. So the employment problem does not reside there. Of course, there will be, let's say, I, I, I hesitate to say creative because it will not be creative, destruction. So a lot of, even within the, you know, the, the relatively advanced manufacturing uh, sector, some companies will go bankrupt, as it happened 10 years ago. But some other ones will be able to, you know, reestablish their frontier position and maybe growth in the future in, in terms of unemployment, in terms, sorry, in terms of employment as well. So where is the big uh, um, hole in terms of employment? Well, it's, a, it's in the South as it's in the service sector. If you break down um, the Eurostat statistics by sector and employment in those sectors, you see that there are sectors such as strikingly tourism, restaurants and catering, entertainment, even culture, 
that employ in Italy less than 50% of workers than say France, or you know, making the, the appropriate proportions uh, any uh, member state of the European Union. So we have bottlenecks, incredible bottlenecks uh, that hamper, that hinder the growth expansion, the, exp the economic expansion of such sectors and their capacity to demand work and to supply jobs. If we don't solve that problem, we will never solve the public debt problem. Because of course there is a denominator and, and our problem is in the denominator, okay? Our public debt was as high as Belgium's public debt. Belgium has been able in uh, 15, 20 years to reabsorb it thanks to growth, employment growth and economic growth. We haven't been able to do that. Italian yeah, economists, yeah, Marita, 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 reason, Marita, we not, said that we, we should stop at uh, 6.30, so perhaps yeah, we sorry, have to- Sorry, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always, I always <laughs> talk too much. Yeah. So, yeah. Maybe we can- this, this solidarity, the European Union solidarity, Perhaps what we need is what the European Union is discussing right now, namely the provision of resources that can be invested in the economy and not in welfare, not even social investment, so that people can actually be, have a job. And, uh, and maybe also we need advice, you know, with benchmarking and bad practices on what kind of bottlenecks are, are, are really op operative in the South, apart from mafia. I don't believe that that is you know, the major uh, bottleneck because the mafia is in the North as well, okay? And, and the labor market uh, doesn't work that bad here. So I think that the, I would like Europe to be very active in the future in, in this respect. I mean, to a, a big investment plan or a, a big, you know, uh, amount of resources that can be put into the real economy in Italy with some good plan in order to, uh, you know, act on the denominator. Thank you. Thank you. So we're already, our time is up, but, but given that you raised important questions, maybe I'll allow for two of you to react quickly, respond, or would like? I have talked enough as well. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. And that how it will be. Okay, <clears throat> I, I just want to make a, a short remark on the discussion about growth regimes and um, and the EU and um, and this remark goes to, to Waldraut and then I will come to Maurizio. I think the, the whole analysis of growth models and growth regimes is very useful analytically to identify the problems. And I think it helps us to identify both the economic development and the economic dynamics within Europe, but also the political dynamics. And what the, the data ha that um, Bruno has shown, for instance, on the political polarization and the rise of the far left in, in the periphery countries and of the far right in the, in the core countries has to do with growth regimes and, and um, growth models. And I think we need it analytically. And therefore, I, I would defend the research on that and I would defend the approach. I don't think it helps us politically and I think we may have to make a distinction between the analytic, uh, you know, the, the analysis and the political response. And with regard to the political response, I'm much more with Anton and, and to some extent also with Maurizio, because I think um, what, what we need in the EU is really much more centralization and the growth of an EU budget, which we can use for investment purposes. And the investment purposes must go beyond the social investment side. I, I do... I like the social investment side and I think you know there, there's obviously a big gap in the periphery countries when it comes to education and training and all these things but we also need real investments and uh, the approach by the commission now to focus on the new green deal and to help the Euro European economy to transition into a green economy 
would allow for the investments that need to be made, and in particular in the peripheral countries. And that is the area we we should we should be thinking about. And if we think about the you know southern Italy, we should be thinking about energy. We should be thinking about solar energy and and these kinds of things. You know whether the greening would be the new growth strategy of the EU and how we can drive that you know from a central you know from the center you know from the European level not from the level of the national governments but from the European level and how we can mobilize the funds in order to finance that and you know whether it's corona bonds or whether it's any other financial mechanism you know is is secondary in in that regard and I would interpret you know what the the German employers have done with Medef and uh, others you know this week is is exactly this kind of initiative and you know we should be supportive of that and and sort of cherish that that you know that the, the that the business side is now coming together at the European level and says we need more investments you know this is really the new development which we should uh, you know f uh, support in the future you know that would be my response to that thank you very much so it seems like we should have scheduled a three hour webinar, but uh, because I like to finish seminars on time, I'll leave the uh, Valtraud an opportunity to conclude today. Do you want to, to, me. to react to Maurice? <laughs> Um, I do not have very much to say. It's it's very difficult to give uh, a perspective that is hopeful and so on. But what I'm pretty sure is that the last time where basically the old were the old I mean pensioners were safe from everything and the working age population had to take the brunt of the adjustment. I think that cannot be done anymore. So in a way, I'm ending with this old saying, what can't go on forever will not go on forever. Uh, and that is, I think, there will be a new intergenerational uh, contract. And I do think what somebody also asked in the Q&A, we need to do research and basic income, uh, universal basic income. And it is, I know, an idea that is quite contested. I have myself not made up my mind. But it will be a, one of the ways to go to say to to guarantee the minimum and then see what what has to be done on top of that and whether there a lot more is private i'm afraid this is probably the way where we go thank you very much so let me thank again all the panelists uh, and the audience of course it's very interesting webinar uh, we've both we've discussed lots of things but as as the overtime shows very far from exhausting this topic. There will be many major developments in the coming months, uh, I'm sure. So maybe you'll be back uh, okay. at some point, maybe physically in Paris, uh, to keep discussing these issues within Civica or, or other stages. Thank you very much. Have a good Thank evening. you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very Thank much. You. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, Maurice.